After 10 years of war in Syria, more than 400,000 people are dead, millions have been displaced from their homes, and the conflict shows little sign of winding down. I spoke to James Jeffrey, the Trump's administration's special representative for Syria, about the future of the country, the Assad regime, and the region. This is One on One. James Jeffrey, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me, Ali. Well, it's been over 10 years since the start of the Syrian civil war, a conflict that unfortunately has killed over 400,000 people and displaced millions. Uh, interestingly, with the pandemic, with Afghanistan, the U.S. election, all those major news, of course, Syria somewhat disappeared from the headlines and the global attention. What is the status quo, realistically speaking? Is there a realistic opportunity and chance for, an, uh, for the conflict to end anytime soon? The answer to the last is yes, but I'll have to trace back a bit to explain it. Right now, thanks to cooperation between Turkey, uh, the United States, Israel, the Arab League, and the European Union, and the UN, and uh, the various opposition forces in Syria, the uh, conflict has been brought to a virtual standstill since 2018, when the Russians agreed uh, in Sochi at that point uh, with uh, President Erdogan not to go into Idlib. And since then, the conflict has been basically frozen, analogous to Ukraine. But also analogous to Ukraine, it is an extremely serious geostrategic challenge for all of us in the Western Alliance and in the Middle East. Uh, it is a terrible humanitarian crisis, as you said, uh, but it also involves five armies, Turkish, Iranian, Israeli, American, uh, and Russian, uh, having moved in along with uh, Assad's forces in the opposition. There can be a solution building upon this ceasefire, or not ceasefire officially, but effectively this frozen conflict, uh, when and if uh, the Biden administration, the UN, the Europeans, Turkey, Israel, and the Arab League decide that they have to work together for a compromise solution that meets everybody's minimum security concerns, of which Turkey, for example, has many, as does the United States, uh, the Arabs, and Israel. And we'll get to the role uh, of each of those countries that you've mentioned in just a moment. But uh, on paper, let's talk about the U.S. here for a second. On paper and officially, the American opposition to Assad, the Assad regime, continues. But uh, there are very clear signals that regional actors are already looking past the, the civil war. The UAE's foreign minister met recently with Assad in Damascus. Jordan's king recently spoke uh, on the phone with Assad. And Egypt's foreign minister said Syria could rejoin the Arab League pretty soon. Most importantly, perhaps, there's a deal which would send Egyptian gas uh, to Lebanon via a pipeline running through Syria, a deal that would undoubtedly financially and politically strengthen Assad. So the American strategy to isolate Assad is no longer working, is it? Um, I wouldn't go that far. First of all, uh, back in the Trump administration, when we were very aggressive going after uh, Abu Dhabi and other capitals that were reaching out, we still, despite our efforts, saw these efforts to try to uh, reach out to Assad. It's important to understand, and I've talked to the foreign ministers and other top officials of all of these countries, they're not trying to be friendly to Assad. They're trying to find a solution. They see that the United States is not as active, and the U.S. government, which just has been finalized its own policy towards Syria, says that it's not pushing hard to resolve it right now. Seeing that, these countries are saying, let's see if there's a deal. The problem is, and I've seen this repeatedly, I've talked to folks, including Americans, who try to negotiate with Assad, he is unwilling to compromise with anybody. Uh, the Emiratis, the Saudis, the Jordanians have real interests that they want Assad to deal with. He's saying no. One of the interests is to get the Iranian long-range missile systems out of Syria, to stop that from being a showplace for a major regional conflict between Iran and the uh, uh, Arabs in Israel and Turkey. Another uh, interest is uh, 
uh, humanitarian efforts to get the refugees back. Assad has to change his policies. He's shown no sign of doing that. So while these countries are trying to reach out, they're not getting anywhere. And uh, I've also talked, as I said, to some of these people, and I'm pretty sure that uh, Assad is not going to be welcomed back into the Arab League anytime soon. We'll see. Uh, Ambassador, how sincere is that strategy, really? Washington said Egypt, Egypt's deal to send Lebanon gas via a pipeline through Syria would be exempt from U.S. sanctions. And there are sources that are saying that it was the Biden administration itself who advised the participating countries that they could avoid sanctions by financing the deal through the World Bank. How sincere is that strategy? Um, the Biden administration certainly... Uh, has pushed for an interpretation of our sanctions that would allow uh, the gas and electricity deal to Lebanon. They justify that on the basis of the acute humanitarian situation in Lebanon. Uh, can one suspect that they also are interested themselves in sending a signal uh, to uh, the Russians, to the uh, Iranians, and to Assad that they're willing to at some point compromise? I'll be honest. In the last administration, which was famous for taking a tough line on Assad and the Russians and Iranians, we actually worked a similar deal. The point is, what we put on the table with the Russians was, as I said, it was very similar. Uh, you have to deliver. We want a full, accepted, acknowledged national ceasefire as laid out in the UN resolution 2254, accepted by Assad. We want more effort against uh, uh, ISIS, the Islamic State. We want the Iranians to start pulling back from the borders in the south, and we want some political compromise in the UN effort for a constitutional committee. Those were our conditions. The Russians and Assad didn't meet them, so we didn't go forward with it. I don't know what the administration is trying to do with this particular uh, strategy. Again, they say that it's not aimed at Syria, but at Lebanon. They also say that they have discouraged uh, some leaders, including specifically the uh, UAE foreign minister from going to uh, see Assad. I do know, however, I've heard the same things you've had, that other uh, Arab leaders believe that they have been encouraged, at least uh, they're uh, not sure what the U.S. position is. So you have a point there. Uh, if I understand you correctly, the U.S. will not move to normalize ties and upgrade its relations with the Assad regime anytime soon. Do I, do I get that correctly? Uh, on the latter, yes, it is stated that officially in various kinds of ways. Uh, on the former, uh, it at times discourages, as I said, it did the uh, Emirati's foreign minister. At other times, and I've heard from very senior people who've been doing it, uh, they feel they've gotten a green light. So I think that it's a little bit unclear. While the U.S. has officially finalized its new policy, which looks a lot like a uh, less enthusiastic version of the policies of uh, the Obama, late Obama and Trump administrations, uh, it clearly isn't, uh, we aren't fully clear what that policy is because nobody has announced it officially on the record yet. And, and so there's some speculation, of course, is one of the main reasons of why the Biden administration is not discouraging Arab countries from engaging with Assad is to counter Persian, it is to counter Iranian influence in the region. Is that something that uh, rings true to you? You're absolutely correct. This was the argument that the uh, Emirates made to Mike Pompeo when he flew out with me to talk with them about what they were trying to do at the beginning of 2019. So it's been a long time cooking. Uh, but the point is, uh, we do not think that the Sunni Arab states can replace Iran as Assad's friend for Assad's main government project, which is to ethnically cleanse the country of the Sunni Arab population. Half the population, over 12 million people, almost all of them Sunni Arabs, have been driven from their homes. Half across the borders, as you know, in Turkey, over 3 million with you, uh, another almost 3 million in Lebanon, Jordan, and in Europe, and 6 million more, 3 million alone in Idlib, under your control, uh, have been driven again from their homes, and they're afraid to go back. Uh, and uh, Assad has done nothing to make it easier for them to come back. I just don't see the Arab states accepting uh, a uh, cruel totalitarian butcher like him uh, who's doing that to uh, his own Sunni Arab population. Another theory that has been put forth is America's struggle to stop uh, Assad's rehabilitation 
on the world stage, or at least in the region, is due to uh, declining U.S. influence in that uh, region. Uh, would that be going a step too far, or would you concur with that? It's a step too far. That would have made sense three months ago in the immediate aftermath of the pullout from Afghanistan. We looked feckless in how we did it, and people worried that we were no longer engaged around the world. Uh, but two things. First of all, you should read uh, Lloyd Austin's uh, the defense secretary's uh, speech on the Middle East that he just gave at the Manama Security Conference. Austin emphasized in the strongest terms that the United States military will remain in the region and will live up to all of its commitments and is every day proving it. For example, now uh, the Saudis, with American help, are uh, shooting down over 90 percent of the missiles and drones and other rockets that the Houthis in Yemen, with Iranian support, are shooting at Saudi Arabia. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, while it doesn't involve the Middle East specifically, uh, the very uh, realpolitik, dramatic American uh, new alliance with Britain and Australia and the submarine sales against China shows that the United States is not withdrawing from the world. What we're doing is we're cutting our losses in places that make no sense, and that was the case in Afghanistan after 20 years, and we're focusing on what's important. The Middle East, as Austin emphasized, is one of those places that are important to us. Uh, when I ask you if there's an end to the conflict in Syria inside, you said possibly this is a frozen conflict and it might depend on a few moves on the ground. But realistically speaking, after 10 years, removing Assad from power doesn't seem to be a realistic option at this point anymore. What is the U.S. roadmap ahead in the country? Yeah, a good question. First of all, uh, the Trump administration, as you know, the Obama administration took a policy of uh, regime change, initially supporting the opposition, working with Turkey. Uh, that eventually faded. Uh, the Trump administration formally, in a uh, uh, report on its policy to the uh, U.S. Congress in March of 2019, it's unfortunately uh, classified, but the uh, key point of it is not, we said it all the time, is we're not involved in regime change. We're not trying to replace Assad. What we're trying to do is replace his behavior with behavior that is more acceptable to the international community. That gets to the security concerns we all have. It's the Islamic State that's raging out of control in Assad's areas. It's the use of chemical weapons. It's the huge insecurities Turkey faces on its southern border. It's the 12 million refugees and IDPs. It is uh, the Iranian long-range weapon systems that threaten Israel, and its refusal to take any steps to work with the UN. Those are the things we need to change. Assad, with help from his Iranian and Russian friends, can change all of these and still maintain control of his country. But that will require compromise. That's what we put on the table. I believe that sooner or later the new administration will put something like that on the table, too, because the point is Assad may be, uh, have preserved his uh, uh, presidency, but Assad has not won this conflict. 30 percent of the country is not under his control. The Israelis, while they usually don't announce it, are dominating the airspace, hunting Iranian targets. And as we uh, talked just a minute ago, half the population has fled and I'm coming back anytime soon unless Assad changes his ways. And I think it's fair to say that there's not going to be a future solution in, uh, in Syria without Russian or even Iranian involvement, is there? Uh, absolutely not. But again, they've achieved their minimum goals. They've kept a friendly government in Syria. Uh, Russia has kept its bases, uh, and they'll live to fight another day. Uh, the point is, do they want to maintain this very risky, somewhat costly, frozen conflict with all of these armies uh, rubbing up against each other? The Russians were sufficiently interested in what we put on the table for uh, President Putin to invite uh, Secretary Pompeo to Sochi in May of 2019. And the Russians were uh, uh, pitching some kind of compromises right up to the end of the Trump administration. So the Russians are not adverse to this. The problem is they knew that Trump was erratic on Syria. He pulled our troops out twice, and we just barely got him to reverse that decision. Uh, and he just generally wasn't interested in it. The uh, point is, however, that Syria is not going to go away. 
The administration right now is focused on the nuclear negotiations with Iran, but the whole region, including Turkey, is very, very focused on Syria. It's the number one security concern I think Turkey has. The Israelis have said it's its number one security concern. And the Arab states take a slightly different position. Iran marching through all of these Arab states, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, is their number one security concern. So I don't think we can hide from uh, a more active policy for long. And you mentioned Turkey, uh, a country you know well, of course, you served as U.S. ambassador to Turkey not too long ago. Uh, therefore, you know very well that there are long-standing disagreements between Turkey and the U.S., particularly over North uh, Syria. Turkey, of course, considers the U.S.-backed YPG as an extension of the PKK, which is recognized internationally as a terrorist organization, not just by Ankara, but by your own country as well, by the U.S. and the EU as well. Why is, the U, uh, why is the U.S. risking to aggravate and lose an ally, potentially even a NATO ally uh, such as Turkey, by supporting a group which is deemed internationally as a terrorist organization? Well, I think you know the history. It goes back uh, now 14 years to 2014, when uh, uh, we went in to help what was known then as the YPG, uh, now the Syrian uh, Democratic Forces, and we knew then, as we do now, that they are associated with the PKK. There's no doubt about that. But again, they're not on our terrorism list. We went in there. We did this with the knowledge of Turkey. At the time, there was a ceasefire with the PKK, and Turkey was talking to the political wing of the YPG. Now, that all changed in 2015, 2016. Uh, both sides made a few mistakes, but here's the reality. Uh, it is We and Turkey have overriding security concerns that we share in Syria. It is to ensure that Iran does not establish a base, that Russia does not become more aggressive, and that Assad does not turn on its, his neighbors or create more refugee flows and allow the Islamic State to rage out of control. We work together with Turkey on all of these things. We disagree on our partner in the Northeast. The problem is, and we've made this clear, uh, and it's a dilemma for Turkey, we cannot remain in the Northeast uh, without having a local partner. And that local partner, as I said, has been for the last um, seven years, the Syrian Democratic Forces. Their focus in the Northeast is fighting uh, the Islamic State. They're good at it. We have had an agreement since now over two years with Turkey uh, on October 17th, 2014. 19, after Turkey went into uh, the central area of the Northeast, uh, there's been essentially a ceasefire, and that uh, basic uh, uh, program is holding. Now, the PKK uses Syria as a base to attack Turkey. That's true. Uh, they are, uh, and we are watching that closely. We have certain understandings with Turkey on that, and we have certain understandings with the Syrian Democratic Forces. Ankara has uh, said repeatedly that it will not tolerate uh, the PKK-affiliated YPG along its border with uh, Syria. Do you understand Ankara's concerns here? Oh, of course. We've heard it a thousand times. Uh, it makes sense. Uh, we actually negotiated an agreement to get the PKK, not the PKK, the YPG, the Syrian Democratic Forces, back between 4 and 14 uh, kilometers. Uh, Turkey, in the end, decided to go in itself. But the point is, Turkey has cleared... Well, Turkey has taken most of the territory uh, to the south of Turkey in Syria, certainly uh, the whole area to the west of uh, the Euphrates, and a big area to the east of the Euphrates. And Turkey has an agreement with Russia, I don't think the Russians are carrying it out very well, to uh, have the uh, Syrian Democratic Forces pull back in those areas of the northeast where the Russians now are. But that's an issue between uh, Turkey and uh, the Syrian Democratic Forces, because the U.S. does not operate in those border in areas anymore. Russia does. So you need to ask the Russians about that. Turkey has indicated in order to protect its civilians, it needs to carry out a new military operation in northern Syria. But, and this is a direct quote from you from a recent interview, you said, Unlike in the past, Ankara should not expect Washington to ignore any missteps in the region that would jeopardize its allies uh, there. Um, end of quote. What consequences would Turkey have to face if it well, were to... Well, we saw what happened last time. We saw what happened last time in 2019. Uh, there were extraordinarily uh, heavy sanctions immediately imposed by President Trump on the Turkish government, on uh, various Turkish actors. 
and we were able to uh, uh, then negotiate a resolution pretty quickly that, as I said, is still held. <clears throat> now, President Biden and President Erdogan talked about this uh, in their recent meeting, uh, and uh, we'll wait and see where Turkey will act. A lot depends on if Turkey acts, where it acts, against whom it acts, and how it acts. But uh, anything that endangers our troops, and our troops are embedded with the Syrian Democratic Forces, uh, is going to be a problem, obviously. What kind of Turkish involvement, if any, in northern Syria would be acceptable to Washington at this point? Uh, I'm not the administration. They would have to answer that. Again, anything that uh, comes uh, at uh, U.S. forces, uh, and Turkey knows where they are, would, of course, be a real problem. Mm -hmm. Or anything that undercuts our ability to carry out uh, our joint operations against the Islamic State would also be a problem, because we see the Islamic State not so much in the Northeast, but in the rest of Syria as a major threat, including to Turkey. Look at the number of attacks you've had, mass casualty attacks you've had from the Islamic State. No one other than Iraq and uh, Syria has suffered more from them than you. Uh, so that's important as well. So we'd have to see. U.S.-Turkish relations, of course, have been a bit on the down since 2013, 2014. You mentioned it. H how can both countries uh, turn a new page? How can both improve that relationship? Well, one thing is, first of all, uh, to build on the relationship that President Biden and President Erdogan have established in their two meetings. Another would be for the United States to look favorably at the recent Turkish idea uh, to purchase F-16s. That's very, very important. A third way would be to cooperate for an overall political settlement to that Syrian dilemma. Uh, it is a major danger to uh, Turkey. It is a major danger to all of our other partners and allies. Uh, and uh, that is an area where we can, and frankly, we have, for example, in Idlib, cooperated. Furthermore, throughout the whole region, reaching way up to the north into the Black Sea, the Ukraine, the Caucasus, uh, Central Asia, and in much of the Middle East, uh, Turkish and U.S. interests overlie. We are both status quo countries. We both are per defending a regional order that has been very good to both of our countries, that is being threatened by Russia, threatened by Iran, threatened by uh, Islamic terrorist groups. And we need to work together against them, and we are. And you mentioned Iran, uh, of course, a country that is very much on the agenda of uh, President Biden. Upon taking office, as a matter of fact, he seemed quite willing to revive the 2050 nuclear agreement with uh, Iran, a deal that he himself oversaw as vice uh, president. What is the status quo on that one? Iran, Tehran has said repeatedly the U.S. must first lift sanctions before one can even discuss reviving the deal. What would you advise Biden to do at this particular point? Continue doing exactly what he is doing. Biden has managed to unite both the Europeans and, uh, on the one hand, in the regional partners, Israel and the Arabs on the other. President Obama had the European states with him who were desperate for a nuclear agreement, but he alienated the Arab states and Israel. They thought he was making too many concessions and ignoring Iran's uh, uh, malicious actions in the region. President Trump, by pulling out of the agreement, pleased the Arabs and Israel, but really alienated the Europeans. President, uh, uh, and to some degree, Turkey. President uh, Biden, on the other hand, uh, by going back, by trying to go back into the deal, uh, is checking the box with the Europeans. But by the same token, he has not uh, conceded to any of the outrageous Iranian demands that go beyond just returning to the agreement. He's held the line, not made concessions, and kept uh, our Arab friends, Turkey and uh, Israel, informed. And that makes the region also like his policy. So I think he's doing fine. If uh, we do not achieve a return to the JCPOA, and it is quite possible we will not with this new Iranian government, then the United States, our partners and allies, will have to find different ways to contain Iran's nuclear ambitions. It is absolutely critical that we do so. Tehran holds influence over Iraq's internal affairs, another country you know very well, another country where you served as U.S. ambassador. Iraq, of course, just held elections a month ago and now is in a very complicated process of trying to form a governing coalition. To say that the election took place in a tense environment would probably be an understatement with an assassination attempt on Prime Minister al-Kadimi. The turnout was actually quite 
low. And many Iraqis indicating that many Iraqis don't seem to believe in any real changes anymore, any bright futures that may lay, uh, lie ahead for them. You know the country well. What's your prediction? How is this going to, going to play out? Um, if left to themselves, the Iraqis, uh, who have done very, very well, emerging with our help from the violence in 2007, 2009, uh, then again with international help, defeating the Islamic State in 2016, 17, and continuing, pretty uncommon in the Middle East, uh, to have a democratic system uh, and uh, uh, developing their economy, particularly the oil sector, they've actually done very well. And I'm very proud of uh, my minor role uh, working there for three years and for three more years working on Iraq, along with many other Americans, along with other countries that have been much involved, such as Turkey, such as the Arab states, such as the Europeans. But we have to realize they're not being left alone. The Iranian model for the region is what you see today in Lebanon. A total collapse of the state, a total collapse of the economy. <clears throat> the people are destitute because Iran is controlling the entire state by infiltrating it, by developing local militias, local political figures who are loyal not to their own country, not to Beirut, but loyal to Tehran. That is the model they will try to do in Iraq, and they've made some progress. It's actually the model that they're trying to do, despite their friendship with Assad in Syria. We see this uh, all over the country uh, as the Iranians try to dig into local communities, local tribes and such, uh, some conversions to Shia Islam, uh, some political and military arrangements and such. This is how they work. They're a danger. They're a threat to the entire region. They're a virus. Ambassador Jeffrey. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me.